Hi, my name's Sean Lee Davis and welcome to Adventures to the Edge. This week I'm on the Solomon Islands in the Western Pacific to see how rising sea levels and climate change are directly affecting the local inhabitants here as well as the marine ecosystem. Wildlife is under threat like never before. Man-made climate change, habitat loss and illegal poaching are devastating the world's environments. We've lost half the animal species on the planet in the last 40 years, and all large marine life could become extinct by 2050. I'm Sean Lee Davis, a photographer, filmmaker, and conservationist with a passion for adventure. I photograph some of Asia's most glamorous celebrities, and now I'm turning my camera on nature's true beauty. I'm out to showcase the glory of the natural world and raise critical awareness about poaching and exploitation. Join me on Adventures to the Edge. Hong Kong is a thriving metropolis, running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It has one of the most famous skylines in the world, the City of Light and Neon. But this all comes at a cost. All of this activity needs electricity and lots of it. Over 65% of Hong Kong's energy needs come from oil and coal. And as the world burns these fossil fuels, more and more greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere, accelerating global warming. We can track climate change back to the industrial age. The CO2 has increased in the atmosphere, temperatures have gone up, storms have increased, and coral bleaching events, especially in the last couple of decades, have really increased. In 2015, the Earth's surface temperatures were the hottest on record, and 2016 is set to be even hotter. Industrialized farming, deforestation, transportation, and the burning of fossil fuels increase greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. As our planet warms, ice sheets melt, which leads to sea level rises. Oceans absorb up to 50% of the atmosphere's carbon dioxide, which then makes the water more acidic. This can be deadly for coral and crustaceans alike, having an impact right up the food chain. This year, the oceans are experiencing an unprecedented coral bleaching event that is threatening to turn one's bountiful reefs into watery deserts with devastating consequences for the communities that depend on them. To see for myself the effects that our carbon-hungry lifestyle is having on both communities and marine ecosystems, I head for the Solomon Islands, which is experiencing rising sea levels at three times the global average. These islands are located in what's known as the Coral Triangle, an area that is home to 76% of all known coral species and supports 120 million people. There's this incredible cultural and biological diversity. It's almost like the cultural diversity went mad at the same time that the biodiversity went mad in this part of the world. Rick Hamilton is the Melanesia Program Director for the Nature Conservancy. He works with communities in the Solomon Islands to protect the delicate marine environment that flourishes here. Climate change is, is really starting to impact food security and especially for somewhere like the Solomons where probably 95% of the protein base comes from the sea. It's a real issue. If we look at some of the predictions around bleaching, if we look at some of the predictions about ocean acidification, it's going to be a very, very big issue in the future. To better understand the threats posed to the communities here, Rick takes me on a tour of the nearby islands. come across an island that is already suffering from the stark effects of global warming. What we're seeing here is the terrestrial forest, some of which is perhaps hundreds of years old, is now long coping and the only vegetation we're seeing is, is mangroves. And if you look out this way, in the 90s, 
This was all forested and all beached right out to those far outer islands. And all the way out there? All, all the way out there. And this little island just over here, yeah. it was sand beach around all the way over to there. In the 90s, so that's all been that's pushed back by rising sea levels. It's all been eroded away, and once you lose the vegetation, then of course it's very easy for the sea to just come across and completely wash out the sand. And if this trend continues, we're going to see some inhabited islands being affected? There's already some inhabited islands in Isabel where they have relocated, because what happens in the Solomons, normally what impacts people most is once you get seawater coming in and filling up the, the wells ah. and, and if you get storm level events coinciding with king tides then you have whole village systems which are inundated and once the wells are inundated with salt water then it really becomes uninhabitable especially in communities where they don't have a lot of uh, water tanks unless urgent action is taken entire islands could be wiped off the map the effects of climate change have been exacerbated by the logging industry driven by global demand for timber. Solomon Island's economy for the last decade has pretty much been driven by unsustainable logging practices. And unfortunately, the, the logging uh, efforts don't follow any good code of practice. And, and we have seen some really, really devastating impacts of logging, not just ecologically, but also socially. We head to an illegal logging camp, and on the way, we pass through an incredible mangrove system. Mangroves are nurseries for all manner of species, such as sharks, crabs, fish, and even crocodiles. You might see one today, who knows? So it's really important that we preserve them as a huge center of biodiversity. This has got to be one of the most spectacular mangrove systems I've ever come across. Just listen to how quiet it is. Now, mangroves are in serious decline across the world, but they're very important to communities who harvest the crabs and other fish that live and breed in these mangroves. Not only are they home to a variety of marine life, they also have an important symbiotic relationship with coral. Mangroves stop too much sediment from overwhelming the reefs, but also filter the nutrients, providing nourishment to the coral. They also act as a sunshade, sheltering the reef from the intense sun of the tropics. Scientists have observed that when mangroves are cleared, either through logging or seaside development, coastal damage from storms is much more severe. We press on. Arriving at the illegal logging site, the contrast couldn't be more stark. You can clearly see the uh, remnants of hardwood trees that have been cut down. These hardwood species are especially prized in Asia, but are also very hard to replace in the wild once they've been cut down. Forest clearance destroys the habitat that many species depend on to survive. And for communities who supplement their diet by foraging in the jungle, it robs them of a key source of food. 99% of the people in logged areas don't benefit. It's mainly men residing in places like Honiara who are getting most of the benefits of logging. And the brunt of that um, extractive industry is borne by the people who are so heavily dependent on those ecosystems. According to WWF, up to 13% of global carbon emissions is generated through deforestation. And by cutting down forests, we are also removing nature's way of processing the greenhouse gases that we pump into the atmosphere, as forests absorb huge amounts of CO2. While deforestation is not just a problem isolated to the Solomon Islands, perhaps here more than anywhere else, the direct consequences of those actions are in plain sight.
After the break, it's time for me to see what effects climate change is having on the marine ecosystem. And I have a surprise visit from a giant of the ocean. Global temperatures are soaring, but man-made climate change is a threat not just to humans, but also to millions of species around the world, especially marine life. Entire ecosystems could be lost as rising sea temperatures and the acidification of the world's oceans take their toll on aquatic species. I'm on the Arnavan Islands in the Western Pacific to see what effects global warming is having on its communities and marine inhabitants. An area of outstanding natural beauty, the waters here are also a biodiversity hotspot. At the heart of this ecosystem are the coral reefs. But corals are under huge threat by an unprecedented global mass bleaching event due to rising sea temperatures, which could be a disaster for both marine life and humans alike. So in terms of contributing to the sustenance and the maintenance of biodiversity on, on our planet, they're extremely important. They provide habitat for a whole number of adult fish as well as nursery grounds in different parts of the reef for juvenile fish. So the whole reef ecosystem is important for the maintenance of fisheries. Rodsam has been studying coral for over 40 years. It's his lifelong passion. Climate change affects corals in a couple of ways. The one that we know more about and are probably more concerned about is coral bleaching. The corals turn white, the whole reefs turn white, and uh, where this is very severe, the corals die. Coastal communities rely on coral reefs as a natural barrier against storms. If the reefs die off, communities will be exposed to the full force of cyclones, and millions of people who depend on the fish that inhabit the reefs will lose their primary food supply. The stakes couldn't be higher. Rod takes me out on a research dive to assess the health of the coral around the islands. Bright and early, we're just offshore from the Arnavan Islands, and we're going for our first dive. And I have to say, the water looks unbelievably clear. You can look right over the edge and peer down to the coral, and it's just a paradise garden down there. We descend down into the blue. As a marine protected area, there is little local human activity that might affect the Arnavans. For Rod, these reefs are an excellent case study for assessing the impact of climate change. Any bleaching or degradation can be traced to changes taking place globally in the world's oceans. There are all manner of species represented from clownfish to parafish to stingrays. It's a stunning garden of coral of all shapes and sizes, absolutely breathtaking. come across the larger, bolder corals, which can live for hundreds of years. As Rod conducts his investigation of the coral, I get close to a cuttlefish, as well as a reef shark. Then we come across an area of dead coral. Fallen tree trunks are a sign that this island is being eroded due to rising sea levels. the coral just now on that dive you know we, there was a lot of dead coral a lot of coral rubble 
lot of clusters of green stuff on the bottom. There was very little live coral. The live coral we saw was fairly small. Then as we, towards the end of the dive, we started to see, see some very big old dead corals covered with living corals. And you know, it begs the question, what caused the disturbance here? Because the coral that we saw was healthy, but something in the past has caused a massive mortality of coral here. We make our way back to camp. But just as we near the camp, we spot something in the water. It's a manta ray, and not just one, but six of them. We quickly gear up and try to follow them, as they are very difficult to find. This is incredible. We found about six mantas, and we're flying the drone to locate them. There's one coming right off here. Oh, this is just unbelievable. But keeping up is not easy. We finally find them again in shallow waters. This time, they're doing somersaults as they feed on plankton. It's simply breathtaking. one of the most spectacular experiences of my life. And totally unexpected, we were just heading home from a dive. You know, there's something so graceful about them. They, they know you're there. And it felt like they were somersaulting just to play with us. sun setting, it's time to head back to camp. This manta is in really turbid water. It's full of plankton, and so it's in feeding heaven. We were surprised about how many mantas we saw, probably because the water's so rich, the productivity is so high. So you see it's got these big flaps by its mouth in the front, helping to funnel in the water over its gills, and it's filtering out the plankton. What's been your conclusion about the health of the corals here? By and large, I find the corals very healthy, but they do suffer, as this picture shows you, the ravages of the cyclone that hit here last year. What we see here, is branching corals that have grown up well over time, and suddenly the big storm surge and the huge impact of those storm waves from the cyclone have broken the corals apart. So one of the consequences of climate change are increased big storm events, and that's yeah. something that people may not think about necessarily, and obviously this would be the result, but presumably these corals would recover quickly. Well, they are recovering here very well. And if you look at the rubble, it's all being glued into place. And then that's providing a great surface for other corals to settle on. Now, one thing we can't complain about here has been the variety of fish life. It's oh, been spectacular. True. It's the variety, but it's the abundance too. And also the sizes of fish. So we've seen good sized fish. All of those are good indicators of a healthy fish stock and no fishing. So one of the things we look for when we try to judge the resilience of reefs is are there big, large, old ones? The big old ones are producing more larvae which help the damaged areas recover. I measured this one and this was 6.9 meters across. That's around 700 years old. 700 years. So for 700 years, Incredible. that has been existing, growing, and uh, observing the changes in the seas. The next morning, I have one final walk around the island. The Arnavan Islands are a majestic example of the incredible beauty of the natural world. But they are also a symbol of what's at stake if we don't combat climate change. As we leave the Arnavans, we come across some dead trees rising out from the water. 
You may be wondering why I'm walking on a sandbank submerged in water. Well, actually, this used to be an island, and I'm told that 10 years ago, they used to come and have picnics on here. It's a stark reminder that climate change is already happening now around the world. There's islands here which have completely disappeared in the last decade. So there's not many Solomon Islanders you're going to find who don't believe in climate change. They've seen it with their own eyes. It's ironic that the communities which have contributed the least to climate change will suffer the brunt of global warming. Here we see the visible evidence of climate change. These trees that existed only a few years ago are now dead as a result of the sea level rising. If we don't act now, up to a billion people around the world could be affected by rising sea levels and also from the destruction of coral reefs. I almost feel like we've started to come into a phase shift of climate change. And unfortunately, I think that might be what humanity needs before it really gets a good kick in the butt and starts to address it. It's vital that those of us who live in the developed world, where energy demand is greatest, do more to mitigate the effects of climate change. We can all follow simple carbon reduction techniques and choose to consume in more sustainable ways. People in, in, in Hong Kong can absolutely help support conservation efforts, either through volunteering or if they're able through fundraising, be that big or small. And they can, they can petition globally, they can petition locally, and they can Make themselves more informed. Don't sit around with your head in the sand in your air-conditioned office thinking that nothing is going to change. Things are changing. Let's get on board. Let's, let's all do this together. Man-made climate change is perhaps the single greatest threat facing our planet. For the sake of seaside communities and marine animals alike, we must all act now before it's too late.